Great. So the next part is my great pleasure to introduce some of the folks I work with in the center now. Um, so Ann Whitman, who many of you may know, she is a force of nature. She knows absolutely everyone across the state of Massachusetts. Um, she's introduced me to more powerful people than, than anyone ever has. Um, but she has just been with us from the start at the center. She was with us at the proposal level for the grant and helped us really think about how to have people with lived experiences voice represented. Um, there's nothing she's afraid to do in terms of advocacy. And she's just been an incredible asset. And I'm, I'm so grateful to have her be one of the presenters today. Um, and one of two of the other people she really introduced me to were Jackie Martinez, um, also a force of nature currently uh, working in the DMH, um, sh one of the DMH shelters actually, with the shelter guests and residents. I think she may have brought some, some guests today, which I'm very grateful to have you here today as well. Um, and she has been incredibly important in so many ways. Um, not only is she the most excellent baker, that uh, this might be an unknown, uh, unknown quality that she has, but she, you know, she can translate these groups. So she has led groups in Spanish. She has translated into, back into English for us so that we could, he we could hear what's going on. So she's letting the, the, really the Latino voice be heard um, in Massachusetts, which is incredibly valuable. Um, and I'm delighted that she's part of our group and that she's here today. And then Sandy Whitney Searles, who comes from the southeast region of Massachusetts and has been a wonderful contributor. I mentioned before that she wrote the newsletter piece. Um, she also, I think, travels an extremely long distance um, to give us FaceTime at the center, which she does without complaint um, and is doing again today. So very, very grateful that that all of you are here and love working with you. Um, and then Hannah Skees, who very graciously um, offered to step in today. She is someone who has been coordinating the listening groups, providing support to people with lived experience. And she's going to start us off and give us the overview of the process. So welcome. Come on up, Hannah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Corey, for that really nice introduction. Um, so as Corey talked about, we are, myself and Jackie and Sandy are going to talk a little bit more about an in-depth look at one of the projects that we're working on at the Center of Excellence. And that project is the listening groups with people with lived experience across the state of Massachusetts. So just a quick overview, we'll talk a little bit about the peer consultants that we've been working with at the COE who've really spearheaded these listening groups and made them possible. We'll talk about how we made the listening groups from start to finish. We'll talk a little bit about the people that we saw in the listening groups, the people with lived experience. Um, we'll talk about what did we find from the listening groups, what are the themes that we saw. And then lastly, we'll talk about what are our next steps. So now that we have these findings from listening groups and these themes, what are we going to do with them? And um, what projects are going to come out of them. So we have peer consultants. So we have three peer consultants today. And so we have six peer consultants that we work with at the COE. And these are people with lived experience of mental health and or uh, substance use challenges in their life. And they are either certified peer consultants or sorry, certified peer specialists or recovery coaches that we work with at the COE. Um, and we really, really value at the COE partnering with the community. And we've really, um, in this project work on community-based participatory research. So what that looks like is really involving community members, in this case peers, in all aspects of research. So the way listening groups developed, we really wanted to establish trust with the community, build partnerships with the community, give voice to people with lived experience, capitalize on their strengths, and really identify what their needs and priorities were. Um, so the way we did this is with our peer consultants, we developed internal listening groups. So we had a mock group where they developed what they wanted the questions to look like, what questions they wanted to ask the people in the communities, um, and kind of what they wanted that format to look like. And from there, they came up with focus areas. So they wanted to know about the intersection of physical health and mental health. They wanted to know about homelessness. Oops, I think we got Sorry. Homelessness. They wanted to know what people's health priorities were. They wanted to know about people's interactions and experiences with peer specialists, um, what people's access to research was, if they were getting research findings, if they knew what the latest research was, um, and if people found that any apps and tools were particularly helpful in their recovery process. 
And as you can see, this is just a little map showing where the listening groups occurred. So we really got across the state of Massachusetts, all the way from Western Mass. We got a group in Holyoke, a few in Springfield, Central Mass in Worcester, we got in the met uh, greater Boston, greater Metro Boston area, and uh, Southeast Mass, as well as the Cape and Islands. So overall, we completed 18 listening groups with a total of 159 people with lived experience. And something that everyone had in common was that they, in the groups, is that they all had um, either experience of mental health challenges or substance use uh, challenges, and they were in recovery from that. And these are just a few examples of the underrepresented communities that we worked with. So as Corey mentioned before, Jackie had conducted three um, groups in Spanish for our Hispanic Latinx population. We worked with a deaf and hard of hearing population, um, a homeless population, an LGBTQ plus population, and college age population. And just going over a little bit about the demographics of the people that we worked with. So about 57% of our participants were female, so the majority were female. Um, and interestingly, 20% of the participants were certified peer specialists themselves, so they were really able to offer an interesting dialogue about the benefits of peer specialists um, working in the recovery communities. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The average age was about 46, um, with a range being between 18 and 88 years old, but the majority of our participants were between uh, their 50s and 60s. And then for race, about, um, the majority of our participants identified as white, 57% identifying as white. Um, and ethnicity, the majority of our participants, 63% identified as non-Hispanic, 28% identified as Hispanic. And just getting into some of those key findings. So these are, we're gonna talk a little bit about the things that we found across um, the different domains that we talked about before. So these are things that came up over and over again and things that people found really important. So one of the biggest themes that came out was the negative effects of stigma. So people really felt this um, about the stigma of mental health challenges. They felt this from their own family members. So this could be family members not quite understanding what their mental health challenges looks like, why a certain um, interaction or behavior was occurring. People really felt this from their own providers. So a lot of our participants talked about how if they disclosed a mental health challenge to a provider, it totally changed the nature of the interaction with their provider. And it felt like they were having a really negative interaction with their provider. Um, and then people also felt that the negative uh, stigma of mental health also really came through in the communities. So people felt this at work with their employers and with their coworkers. And they also felt that in the education uh, setting that there could be more education and more learning about um, mental health. So then navigating the system was another really big theme that came up. So we saw this in both navigating the housing system and navigating the mental health care system. So to talk a little bit about navigating the housing system, this really came up when we brought up homelessness. So people that had experience of homelessness or were actively struggling with homelessness talked a lot about how there was no clear pathway to navigate out of homelessness. There were no clear next steps, no clear um, pathway for people to take and it felt really really people felt alone and really isolated in that process of trying to navigate out of homelessness and kind of the same thing with mental health care a lot of people felt really confused and isolated and alone people didn't feel like they knew what those next steps were they didn't know how to find a provider they didn't know what type of provider they might need and it felt like um, there could be a lot more guidance in that process of really trying to navigate towards um, finding the right type of mental health care and then also another really large theme was that mental health challenges were amplified in combination with other life challenges and kind of the reverse relationship was true as well. So what I mean by that is somebody that was already struggling with mental health challenges, when you added another thing on top of that, it just made their mental health challenges even more challenging. So we saw this with homelessness, we saw this with medical issues, so that could be weight gain, chronic pain, diabetes, people that were trying to quit smoking, um, people struggling with poverty, and people struggling with substance use. And like I said before, the reverse relationship of this was also something that people talked about. So for example, if somebody was struggling with homelessness, you add the mental health challenges on top of that, and it made um, working through the homelessness or navigating out of the homelessness even more difficult. And so next, um, Jackie is gonna talk a little bit about these next two key findings that we saw. Just press the screen when you're done. Okay, thank you, Hannah. Isn't she great? I absolutely love Hannah. <laughs> so this is gonna be brief, and two of the, uh, I'll be um, talking about two key findings. Um, the first one being the barriers to mental health and medical care. 
So while we were doing the listing, uh, um, facilitating the listening groups across the state, um, it was very interesting to, um, to see that communication with the deaf and hard of hearing community, we conducted one listening group with that community. Um, people expressed um, how diminished and lowered um, their quality of health care was due to the lack of communication, lack of interpreters to be exact. With the Hispanic communities, which I conducted three listening groups across the state, um, the language barrier makes um, treatment more difficult and patients must bring their own interpreters, imagine that. Um, so there's a lot of miscommunication in information and that creates a humongous barrier in healthcare um, accessibility. Um, one of the other things that we noticed and I was very surprised in the Springfield area and in the um, Southbridge area, the lack of transportation to get from one side of town to the other people um, were really are still having a very difficult time getting to their uh, provider appointments, sometimes missing their appointments and not being able to get another appointment for two or three months later. Um, and um, these cause um, a lot of barriers in care because if you don't have an interpreter, you don't have transportation to get to your um, to your doctor's appointment, well, you never get to see the doctor in most cases, and people really give up sometimes. Um, the nature of the interaction with providers. Um, participants said that they have negative, if they have a negative interaction with a provider, for instance, the language barrier or the cultural um, un understanding piece, they're most likely not to return. And um, in two of the, these specific areas, there were only like, I'll just say Springfield, for instance, they only have two mental health providers, psychiatrists that speak Spanish, one of them being Latino, the other one um, n not being Latino, and not having that, that, that real um, um, connection. So what happens is that people wait so long, they, they give up and they just, it's just a cycle. Um, and people, um, just don't return to accessing services. The second finding that I'll be talking about will be about cultural humility. The lack of racially and cultural um, diverse providers and, and the lack of cultural understanding really, in, it's not just like in the deaf and hard of hearing community and the Latinx communities, it's in all diverse communities. If there isn't a real cultural understanding of the community, the community is not willing to open up and reach out to mental health providers or any other type of services. And, and my coworker is going to talk about the connection between our peer work and the community. And what else? Um, people feel that they're not being treated with the utmost respect. And um, for me, that's a big thing. Um, I was brought up, um, you know, respecting our elders and. You know, and sometimes the elders really don't know, you know, what's going on and, you know, and not keeping within the family and actually accessing help is very important. And communication, the language barriers causes health information miscommunication in the lack of knowledge of cultural nor norms. So I'll pass it on to Sandy right now. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, my slide isn't up. I don't know how to do this. Okay. That's all right. Go on the green button. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. I'm going to talk about peer support. Um, the people that we worked with, the participants in the groups, um, stated that they felt more comfortable talking to a peer, a person who had lived experience, than they would talking to a clinician. They felt that they could trust the relationship that they put together and um, that they were um, much more consistent in the ways they responded. It was uh, something that I found uh, th like across the board where peers are the most important and um, we're just going with that. They, they also felt that the research 
that um, peers are involved in is probably better research because um, the peers were able to develop, help develop the projects and then see them through to the end. And as far as research goes all the way around, um, they felt that they didn't have any access to um, research findings. And so when we're doing the research on these, um, these panels, these groups, we're gonna go back and let them know um, what we've found. And they would like to have more contact with people who have research of their own. So that's, that's it. And you're up. Sorry. Okay. So I'm Ann Whitman. I'm delighted to be here. I see a lot of uh, friendly faces in the audience, which uh, makes me quite happy and relaxed a little bit. Um, my job is to tell you about the next steps for the Center of Excellence in these listening groups. Um, we want to present these listening groups to a wide variety of stakeholders, um, NAMI groups that are here today, um, DMH area directors, local government officials, and recovery and learning communities. And then we want to take their stakeholder input and help that shape the center priorities and agenda for the COE and our community partnerships for the next few years. Um, one thing that came out of the listening groups that uh, was really important was that people wanted some peer um, designed, conceived, and executed led research projects. Um, and so I got together with the six community consultants and we've created two um, peer led projects. Uh. Um, the first one is the development and production of a video for parents with mental health and substance use challenges. And the second one is the assessment of inclusion and cultural responsiveness of peer-based services. And I want to talk a little bit first about the parenting project and then about our cultural humility project. Um, from the listening groups that we conducted in Lynn and the Latinx uh, community groups, as well as the internal mock group that we had with the community consultants, we found that uh, parents with lived experience of mental health and substance use challenge felt alone, they felt stigmatized, and they felt quite isolated. Um, and just for your information, they felt stigmatized by everyone, their family members, community members, providers, other parents. I myself raised a daughter um, who's 35 now, and other parents in the communities when I was first sober would not send their child to my, my house for a play date with my daughter. So that was very hurtful and stigmatizing. We also heard from the listening groups that parenting is not discussed in the context of mental health treatment. A lot of the individuals felt that um, they could not discuss parenting struggles with their providers for fear of losing their children or losing time with their children. So we saw this whole topic of uh, parenting to be very important. And now we're creating and producing a video about parenting with mental health challenges. I'm very excited. We're filming on December 10th and 11th. And uh, we plan to interview parents and children with lived experience. If you've got any people to suggest to us, uh, we'd love to try them out for the video. Speak to me afterwards. Um, the main point of the video is to reduce isolation and stigma, increase the knowledge of resources, and educate. Um, one, we're very firm out of educating providers. We want to uh, create a culturally inclusive resource for parents and from talking to other researchers, we also know that fathers and non-custodial parents lack support. So we want to include them in the video also. Um, our intention is to disseminate the video among parents, mental health agencies, and providers. And we're really hoping this will serve as a catalyst for change um, within the systems and some novel type of supports for uh, parents. 
I was talking to one of the former commissioners of the Department of Mental Health, and not in the not too distant past, they um, asked parents to give up custody of their children to receive DMH um, services. So I think uh, this video will be, we're very excited about it, and we hope it will improve the lives of parents and children. Um, so our, our next project um, is the cultural humility of peer services. Now, as you heard from previous presenters, um, Jackie and uh, Hannah, many listening groups um, participants reported a lack of culturally competent and culturally responsive services. Um, as you can see from our data, um, most of the participants in our listing group are white, exactly 57%. And the RLCs we know are mostly utilized by white participants. So we wanted to ask the question, why do certain populations not use peer-based services? And what would they find attractive uh, in peer-based services? So we plan to design a, a survey and interview questions to take to these populations. We have some strengths in our community research consultants, and we have strong connections to the Latinx community, the black community, and the Portuguese-speaking community. So we intend to begin with those communities. Um, we are really excited uh, about this project. We've gotten a little feedback about it. And the director of Mass Health actually told us it might be our findings a basis for um, some change within the system. Uh, so we feel that um, by doing a little research, we may improve the model uh, for peer-based services to be much more culturally inclusive. So that wraps up our presentation. Um, I think we're on time. We worked very hard on it. <laughs> and um, I want to open it to questions. <laughs>